Hey, what's up, YouTube? This is Sports Fan Network, and I'm Travis. And I'm Andrew. And today in our video, we got our NFL Week 5 recap. We're going to have five takeaways from Week 5. So, Andrew, I'll start with you. What's our first takeaway? We'll start with the best game of the week. Obviously, the Green Bay Packers going to the Dallas Cowboys and winning that one 35-31 in an absolute thriller. Uh, it was a great game from beginning to end. And Aaron Rodgers coming up big with another come-from-behind victory. Yeah, what a great game. It seems like every time Dallas and Green Bay play each other, they never disappoint. As this came down to the final second. But I want to talk about the Packers' fifth-round rookie, Aaron Jones, out of UTEP. And his first NFL debut start for the Packers. He did not disappoint. He rushed for 19 carries for 125 yards and a touchdown. And I got to say, this Aaron Jones looked really good as he repeatedly ran for – ripped off big runs. It seemed like he's able to run for at least five or six yards every carry. Yeah, he's definitely looked like he can hit the holes really hard. Uh, with Ty Montgomery being injured for this one, it'll be interesting to see how they kind of mix and match the running back reps going forward for the Packers. But on the Dallas side – Ezekiel Elliott really started off slow in this game. He only had 30 yards in the first half, which is kind of alarming for a Cowboys offense that really, you know, puts their, puts their, you know, their energy towards running the football and really dominating the line of scrimmage with that great offensive line. But towards the end of the game, they started getting going with that. He finished the game with 29 carries for 116 yards, and many of them came on their final drive of the game where they went for 17 plays and pretty much exclusively through the running game there and just really show that they can just dominate you whenever they really feel like it uh, from an offensive line and running game's perspective. Yeah, this was another game where Ezekiel Elliott started off really slowly, and this is something that's kind of hurt the Cowboys this season because last year their key success was getting Zeke going early in the game, controlling the clock, you know, running, getting five yards on first down. And this year, in the first half, he's kind of had a lot of slow starts. But Zeke really turned it on the second half and finished with a really strong game. I also want to talk about the quarterbacks for both teams. They both had really good games. They both threw for three touchdowns. But Aaron Rodgers had a little bit more magic in store for the Dallas Cowboys as he orchestrated the game-winning drive as he drove them 75 yards in a minute and two seconds and was able to get the 12-yard touchdown pass of Devontae Adams with 11 seconds left. And you can put it right now. Aaron Rodgers owns the Dallas Cowboys. Yep, yeah, they won their last three games against the Cowboys, two of them in the playoffs. All three of them have been absolute heartbreakers for the Cowboys. And uh, this is a really good rivalry that's been going – that's kind of been brewing so far over the past few seasons. We'll see if they can meet again once the playoffs come around. I'm assuming that they both make it to the playoffs. Yeah, then moving on to our next takeaway, we got Mitchell Trubisky's debut for in the NFL last Sunday night versus the Minnesota Vikings. Andrew, I know you're a Bears fan, so what did you see from Mitch Trubisky? Well, obviously a very exciting night to kind of see the, the debut of the potential franchise, future franchise quarterback for this team. And um, you know what? The stat line doesn't look too pretty. 12-25 for 128 yards, a touchdown, one interception. Uh, that interception ended up setting up the game-winning field goal for the Vikings as they won the game 20-17. to But I thought, I thought there was a lot to kind of build off for this game. I think he looked a lot better than the, uh, the stat line suggested. I mean, the Bears, they have a lot of problems offensively in terms of penalties at the wrong times. Receivers were dropping easy passes. Where he was delivering them on the money in this game. Uh, he looked pretty good. He kind of showed up pretty much everything he has in his package in terms of great athleticism. Uh, the accuracy was on point. He throws beautiful balls. I mean, the first pass of the game was an absolute perfect pass. And I thought he looked pretty poised um, when you consider that he was going up against a very, very good defense in the Vikings who just have studs at every single position. Uh, I thought he looked pretty good out there. Again, the stat line doesn't really show how much um, how much of a good game that he had. I think he looks a lot better than Glennon, that's for sure. Um, definitely an upgrade there. Yeah, he looks like he's a better fit in this offense for the Bears as he's really good at running around, making throws on the run, you know, setting up the play action. And the Bears offense already looked a lot more aggressive with Mitchell Trubisky under center. You know, they're going to have to take some more shots if they want to continue to run the ball with success. I think Mitchell Trubisky is the perfect guy for the Bears to plug in. He's the future of the franchise. In his NFL debut, he looked really good, considering he has one of the worst wide receiving corps in the NFL. Yeah, let's talk about the defenses, too. They both had pretty good, good games on both sides of the ball for the Vikings and the Bears defenses. Uh, these are two of the top defenses in the league at least for the Vikings. The Bears are pretty underrated, and they came out, came out and had a pretty strong game as well. Uh, something for them to build off of as the season goes along. 
Yeah, then moving on to the next takeaway. And unfortunately, if you're a New York Giants fan, your season is over. Both Odell Beckham and Brandon Marshall suffered season-ending injuries on Sunday, and the Giants dropped to 0-5 and is one of the few winless teams left in the NFL. And i got to be honest, this is probably the biggest surprise this year in the NFL. Yeah, both of us had them competing for the division title uh, this season. I mean, we both thought that they were primed to kind of take that next step with some of the weapons they had on offense. And obviously losing Brandon Marshall and Odell Beckham Jr. for the season that's a huge blow for a team that's already had a lot of struggles offensively, especially when you consider that they really can't run the ball at all, and their offensive line has been terrible all season long. So really, I mean, it's just a very disappointing season for the Giants. I mean, who would have thought by this time they'd be 0-5 and, and tied with the Cleveland Browns and San Francisco 49ers, two teams that are openly tanking. Um, I mean, just it, – it, that's the NFL for you. It just, it just – weird stuff happens like this every single year that you just can't predict. Yeah, me and you both thought Eli Manning was having a breakout season with all these new weapons. But I got to ask you now, with the Giants sitting at 0-5, what do they do now? Because I've heard, you know, possibly Ben McAdoo is on the hot seat. You have Eli Manning who's getting up there in age. And this was a roster that was trying to compete for a Super Bowl, but this is beginning to look like a lost season. Yeah, it's a lost season, but they can still, you know, still want to compete for, obviously, for the players. They want to put out a good showing on film for them so they can get – you know, their next paycheck or for whatever team they play for next year, whether it's with the Giants or whether they want to play for another team next year. Obviously, they're going to go out there and they're going to compete every single game. Uh, for Eli Manning, just continue to play strong and play strong football out there. Uh, he's not going to have a lot of help on that offense, though. I mean, it's just brutal with all the injuries and lack of, of offensive line that, I mean, he, he might get, you know, beat up a lot this season. And uh, watch out. He might have his continuous um, streak of consecutive games started might come to an end this season if he continues to get beat up like this. Yeah, and I want to get your opinion real quick. Do you think at the end of the season, if the Giants continue to struggle, do they keep Ben McAdoo or do they fire Ben McAdoo? Well, I've been hearing that, you know, his job is pretty safe at this point, uh, at least for going into next season. Um, but I would probably give it one more year unless they completely just lose the team and they go like 1-15 and or 2-14 and or something like that. Uh, unless it's something like that disastrous, I think you got to keep a warmer year because remember, they did make the playoffs last year. Um, so obviously, he's proven that he can win with this team. Uh, maybe they just need to really just reorganize the team and just, you know, kind of start fresh for next year. Yeah. And then moving on to our next takeaway, we got Ben Roethlisberger looks absolutely horrific versus the Jackson, Jacksonville Jaguars as he threw five interceptions in one game. This is something that we see. It seems like once a year, Big Ben has an awful game. This happened to happen at home for him instead of on the road. But, you know, this offseason, Big Ben seriously considered retirement. And he was quoted after the game saying, maybe I don't even have it anymore. That's not a good news if you're a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Yeah, this has kind of been the story for Big Ben all season, though. I mean, he hasn't really looked like the same Ben Roethlisberger that we've seen in previous, past, in previous years past where – you know, he was kind of considered one of the top five elite quarterbacks in this league. We all thought the Steelers would be an offensive juggernaut this season, and they just really haven't figured it out at all. And a lot of that has to go on Big Ben, who, I mean, five interceptions. Granted, the Jacksonville Jaguars might have, you know, one of the best secondaries in the league, uh, one of the best defenses in the league. I mean, they're just stacked all over the place. All over the place. I mean, you got to give some credit to them. But five interceptions with the weapons that they have on the Steelers and the offensive line that he has – I mean, that's just inexcusable, especially at home, uh, when we know Big Ben plays a lot better at home as in regards to the road. But he's kind of looked like this all season where he's just – his accuracy is off. He's not moving as well in the pocket. Um, obviously, he's still, you know, really hard to take down to the ground, obviously. But he's just not looking like that same guy that we've seen in previous years. Yeah, and besides basically getting the ball to Antonio Brown, he, Ben's really struggled to get the ball to his playmakers like Martavius Bryant – and Le'Veon Bell, and even at times he struggled to get the ball to Antonio Brown. But this was a team that was trying to contend for, like, the number two spot in the AFC, even make a run at the number one against the Patriots. But this season has not gotten off to a good start for them, and they're just basically at this point you want to try to win the division, get into the postseason. But if you're, if you're a Steelers fan, one way the Steelers can turn this all around is that they have to transition from a passing team to our running team, and they got to get Le'Veon Bell the ball more. Last year when they went on their big winning streak, he was getting at least 25 carries a game. 
or more. And he, even though he struggled a lot this season to get going, Le'Veon Bell is still probably your best offensive playmaker. And if you get the running game going, it's going to open up the passing game more and really take some of the pressure off Ben Roethlisberger. Yeah, he kind of talked about you know Le'Veon Bell's struggles. Only three yards per carry so far this season, which is not good for a guy that is expecting to get paid upwards of $15 million per year uh, for his next big contract. So um, obviously giving the ball more will help, but I wonder if his timing is still off from being out of training camp for so long. Um, that might be an issue for this team. I mean, there's just a lot of distractions for the Steelers organization in general uh, just going up and down here. So it's, it'll be, you know, kind of interesting to see if they can kind of pull it all together and kind of get focus for, you know, a run at the playoffs here. Yeah, and then moving on to our last takeaway, we got Kansas City moved to 5-0 in a thrilling Sunday night football game. And Alex Smith has been a dark horse MVP candidate through the first five weeks of the NFL season. He's looked absolutely terrific. And, and Sunday night, he went 29 for 37, 324 yards and two touchdowns. And this is really Alex Smith we've never seen before. He's been really aggressive, taking shots downfield, and he's really thrown a really good ball. His accuracy looks really good, and Alex Smith has not turned the ball over, and he's been picking defenses apart. So if he could continue to play like this, the Chiefs are looking like the best team in the NFL. Yeah, who is this guy? I mean, Alex Smith, you know, Mr. Checkdown himself, throwing bombs down the field. Uh, Travis Kelsey, one of the most dominant tight ends in the league. And then you got to start with Kareem Hunt here, who, you know, he didn't have maybe as big of a game as in previous weeks, but he showed that he can grind it out against a very good Houston, Texas defense. 29 carries for 177 yards. So another solid game for Kareem Hunt, who continues his, you know, campaign to really win Offensive Rookie of the Year um, this season. Uh, he looks fantastic so far. They just have a lot of balance on the offense. And I got to mention Tyree Kill. He might be the most exciting and electric player in the NFL. He had a huge 82-yard uh, punt return for a touchdown that really broke the game open for the Chiefs and really sealed the win for them. Uh, he's, one of the, he's one of my favorite players to watch, just exciting, uh, extremely fast in the open field. Um, just a huge weapon for this Kansas City Chiefs team. Yeah, Tyree Kill is definitely a dynamic playmaker. And on the defensive side of the ball for the Chiefs, Justin Houston had a big night. He recorded 1.5 sacks, and he's really starting to look like that player a few, a few years ago who notched 22 sacks in one season. And when healthy, Justin Houston is one of the premier pass-rushing outside linebackers. And if the Chiefs can get him going with the loss of Eric Berry, that's going to really help their secondary if they can really get to the pressure to the quarterback and cause lots of pressure. Yeah, speaking of defense, I kind of want to talk about the Houston Texans here. I mean, just two huge blows to their defense here. Let's start with J.J. Watt being out for the year with, I believe, a broken – um, it's, it's a broken knee bone injury, basically. And it's yeah, right. it was the tibial plateau fracture, which is yeah. going to sideline him for the rest of the season. And this is really just devastating to see because last year he had that back injury that kept him out for most of last year. And for him to come back from that, to get back on the, on the field, and then to be lost to another season-ending injury for one of the – probably the best defensive player in the NFL, when healthy, he's got three defensive – and uh, defensive MVPs, uh, he's just really good. And to lose a guy like that for the Texans is a huge loss. Yeah, they also lost Whitney Merciless, too, who's probably their second or third best pure pass rusher. Um, just two huge losses for the Houston Texans defense that, you know, their identity is their defense over the past few seasons. And even though Deshaun Watson, who's come in and played very well, by the way, um, that's a huge blow for this team that's looking to really contend in the AFC South. Yeah, talking about Deshaun Watson, what a game he had. He threw for five touchdowns and no interceptions. And he's also starting to put his name in the hat for the Offensive Rookie of the Year. And if you're a Browns fan, you, you just got to be feeling terrible because they passed up on Deshaun Watson, and this guy has performed at every game he's been put in since he took over for Tom Savage. He looks like he could be that quarterback for the franchise of the future for the Houston Texans. So he's had a really great season. Yeah, don't forget they also passed on Carson Wentz last year, too, in the draft. So the Browns, they seem to have a really good idea of, you know, just passing up on franchise quarterbacks. I mean, that's just what they do, I guess, uh, classic Cleveland Browns. But you know, I just want to talk about Sean Watson having that Clemson's connection with DeAndre Hopkins. They hooked up for three touchdowns last night, and those two have been in sync basically ever since Deshaun Watson took over as a starter. 
that's very exciting to look forward to as a Houston for, two, for Houston Texans fans. Who you know, if they can get this connection going, I mean, there, there's nothing. I mean, the sky's the limit for what they can do together offensively. Yeah, the Texans' offense has looked really explosive since Deshaun Watson took over. But that's our thoughts on the NFL Week 5 recap. Let us know in the comments below if you agree with us, if you disagree with us. Let's just keep this conversation going. I just want to say thank you guys so much for watching our videos. Thank you to continue liking and subscribing. That help us out a lot. Yeah, thanks, guys, for watching. Uh, please feel free to like our Facebook page. We just have a Facebook page up. Uh, please leave a like there. and. Uh, Keep on following us as we'll be posting updates and other videos um, up on our Facebook page. So thanks, guys, for watching.